Alrighty, and we are back with more That's Never Happened Before. Hello, Kung Fu Fruit Cup here, joining you all this evening. Tonight, we have on Dwango AC and Soren, who've been showing off Triforce Percent Showcase that was uh, the TAS Showcase, so Tool Assistant Speedrun, that was shown off at this past SGDQ. It was amazing, and so it's so cool to learn more about it. But now we get to see uh, the another aspect of it, of kind of like what's going on and more of like the visual um, parts, like how it's, how it's being displayed in game. So I'm going to leave it to Soren and Dwango. You two take it away and also feel free to do that quick countdown so we can start the timer again for our timer that we don't really need on the show. <laughs> All right. Again, this is not a, you know, this is not a speed run. This is a super play, <laughs> yeah. but let's do it anyway. Three, two, one, go. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be showing off Triforce Percent Ocarina of Time Ace Showcase. We're going to be showing off the, the contents. Uh, of you know what what we used arbitrary code execution to do, uh, what we managed to make inside the game. The Brom that is playing right now has a small mod. It's only a few hundred bytes, and what it does is it will give us arbitrary code execution for free, so we don't have to do the setup. Everything else will be injected, but just at the beginning, we're cheating to get the initial ace just for today. We did this did not happen at GDQ. At GDQ, it was a real cartridge. Safe State did the ex did the exploit, so. Here's the game, Ocarina of Time. This is a save file just starting at the beginning of the game. I've just talked to Saria and then uh, and then saved. What we're gonna do, the wonder item is over there, past that fence. So I'm just gonna line myself up here. And then I'm going to run the uh, set of, uh, this is the task movie file. This is a set of inputs that do goes through the uh, bootstrappers one through four. As the link is going to walk forward into the area of effect, the game will start jumping to controllers, but the controller data will be run by the replay device at that point, and then it will go through the bootstrappers. So I'm going to switch controller, I'm going to unpause, I'm switching controller one to the replay device. So all four connect controllers are connected to the replay device, and um, it is playing this task movie in. And you may notice that it's a little different um, that Link is, you know, rolling instead of sit sitting on the ground with a shield. Um, in this case, we actually don't care where he goes. Um, but yeah, it's done. That was Bootstrappers one through four. That's all done. The hyperspeed loader is is loaded into memory and waiting for further commands, and is drawing a little green bar in the corner. The reason we put a green bar in the corner is to tell ourselves that everything worked correctly so far. So that we know it you know, works correctly so far, but also because the game natively, if you crash, you get a yellow bar in the corner. And if you crash the crash debugger, you get a red bar in the corner. And so we put a green bar in the corner to mean the game is pwned, we have control over everything, we can do whatever we want. So from there, I'm going to switch controller. I have just switched controller one back to my controller here. So I can move Link around now and I'm going to run the next step of the injection. This was all done on stage, except the, the actual setup was done by save state instead of using the shortcut. Um, this was all done on stage, and while we were talking, Dwango was sitting here typing away on the laptop to run each of these scripts. So this is the next script. This is using the hyperspeed loader and injecting data that is at um, specific fixed addresses in memory that is linked to fixed addresses in memory. These are on the expansion pack. Um, and things have to, the, the way the whole system works is a little, you know, changes around a little bit. It, it, things have to be done in that order. Uh, yes, go uh, ahead. So Zango? Soren was is using a TASTM32 replay device made by Onosaurus. You can theoretically buy one of these if you want to. I'm not trying to sell anything. We don't make money on this. This is totally a cottage industry. Uh, we don't, always have stock, but when we do, you can go to shop.tas.bot. That's shop.tas.bot to get a TAS TM32 board of your own. Uh, Soren has one of his own. Uh, I have one here. This is the version 4. Uh, Onosaurus did, did a fantastic job. Uh, the the MOS 2312 helped out a ton. So these are, uh, these are available if you want to try to do this on your own, but it will take a lot of work and you won't be able to do everything we are doing here, just so you're aware because there's some things we weren't able to release. Right, and we'll get into that later at the end. So the first set of data is done, injecting. Um, that was that took about, I don't know, another 15 seconds or so. And that is a bunch of data that, th this is our sort of 
patches to the OOT engine. Um, this is data that was linked to static locations in memory. Basically, the, the game can be divided into code and data that are have to be in known locations in memory, and then files. So like, you know, animations or music or uh, textures or whatever are separate files that um, the game has to know where they are at any time, but it doesn't really matter where they are as long as there's a, there's a directory, basically, that says where they are. And so as long as it can look it up in the directory and find it, it doesn't really matter where it is. It doesn't matter what order they are. So that first part is, is done injecting. And we had to have that finished before Link goes through a loading zone, because if Link goes through a loading zone during that, the, uh, it will crash, basically. Uh, the, the whole system of um, retrying, looking at the rumble results and retrying things if it gets an, if there's an error, that's all fine and dandy. But when we're overwriting parts of the engine, if there's an error, we're we're you know we're messed up immediately. So uh, we have to we have to make that not happen. But as soon as I run the sec the next strip, and this is a script that is just going to start injecting all of the rest of the data for the rest of the run, and this is going to take about six or seven minutes, depending on how long it takes to go through loading zones and things. It has injected a whole bunch of patches for scenes for uh, you know items it's injecting um, Naburu right now it injected the beta Kokiri um, you know it's it's you know it's going through things it has the biggest things for the the finale scene at the end and so as once that has started we have to go through a loading zone and we also have to pause and the loading zone and the pause cause the game to reload all aspects of the game there are some things that are reloaded through loading zone and there's other things including link that are reloaded when you go when you pause. Um, actually, Link is not in memory when you when you get the pause when you open up the pause screen. It unloads Link. It loads in the pause screen into the same memory. So uh, this will allow us to force a reload of Link, and then our patches to the engine stick in some patches when it when it loads Link. It sticks those patches in as it loads Link, and we you know we need those patches to be active. So you know so far you haven't seen anything. Uh, that special, but here we go. Here's our first piece of, uh, this is actually debug content, not beta content, but this was made by the developers. This is the inventory editor. Um, this was, uh, you know, used by the developers to set up Link's state um, so that they could, you know, mess around, try try different aspects of the game. I do not remember exactly all of the items I'm going to need, so I'll do my best, uh, best guess, but I'm probably going to miss some. Um, so in order to uh, turn this on. Uh, we had to, you know, we said we said live. We had to write one byte into memory. It's true. It's one byte that enables this, but we actually wrote a handler that checks constantly when the pause menu is open whether you're pressing L. And when you press L, it turns on that one byte to turn on the inventory editor. Um, but you can see this. This is actually used at one point in the Majora's Mask um, any percent speed run. They used a a different glitch to basically write to memory arbitrarily and uh, turn on the one byte for the inventory editor, and then just gave themselves all the items and warp, you know, use the in-game mechanics to warp to the end of the game. Um, so I'm giving myself all this. These are all the songs. These are the spiritual stones. This was the fire medallion. This is the swords and shields. These are the uh, upgrades for like uh, silver scale and wallet and things like that. And then these are some of the normal items. This is rupees, this is hearts. I go back out of the screen, you can see I have a bunch of stuff now. Give myself sword and shield. I give myself ocarina and boomerang and bottled bugs. Uh, anything you want to add at the moment, Dwango? Uh, no, all I'm going to mention is that one of the things that was a constant comment after the effect is that we weren't very specific about, or we, we tried to be specific and very clear, but there was some confusion around what was beta content, what was on the cartridge, and what wasn't. What you just saw, that really is on the cartridge. It's dev content, yes. I wouldn't necessarily call it beta, so just to rehash that point. Um, but a lot of other stuff we created ourselves, and we'll try to be very specific as we go through this of what's what. Yeah, so here is our next thing to show here. This is the R-Wing from Star Fox 64. This is actually on, on the cartridge. Um, we just literally had to run a you know, few instructions to cause it to spawn. Uh, this was created by the developers back in 1998 to test uh, physics for the fire dragon Volvagia. Um, and uh, basically the idea was Volvagia would you know, fly, fly around the, the sky and they thought it would fly, or she would fly like 
an R wing would, and so they made an R wing, but they left it in the game, and it has all these, you know, custom animations and laser sounds and everything. Um, so yes, that is real beta content, or not even beta in the sense that they never expected to have the R wing in the final game, but it was actually like made extra. by the developers and. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like when the developers are making stuff and they throw things in. The ground. Also, it's one of my favorite things that people discovered that is in this game, and I just had to say something about it. Yeah, so. and you may be asking, how did we spawn it? Well, we wrote code mm -hmm. to listen for button presses, and when I hold L plus D down, it will spawn the art wing, and I can spawn this anywhere. I forget if I might read the code that it would check if one is already spawned. Let's let's find out. Yeah, it checks if one is already spawned. It won't spawn another one if one is already spawned, but this one is spawned. It's out there, I will just ignore it for now. And I could spawn that anywhere. Oh, there's, it's shooting at me. So um, this is the next thing. This is completely fabricated, this exit sequence. This is not on the car cartridge at all, um, but we needed a place to start with the, uh, with the, like, you know, getting people to suspend their disbelief about maybe I could have done this. And in a sense, you could have done this if you had actually done a setup you could have done something like this, but not just by going to the woods and doing this sequence of exits. So this is the sequence of exits that you need to perform, go through, um, in order to go through the Lost Woods in Zelda 1. Except in Zelda 1, you just literally navigate northwest, southwest. Whereas here, we're getting lost out of a north exit, then getting lost out of a west exit, then getting lost out of a south exit, and then getting lost out of a west exit. And again, this is just completely custom code that we wrote. Um, that is that is checking for these. It's it's actually running every frame, checking where Link is and whether he is in this scene and within a certain radius of these points, which we placed in the exit areas. So as he's walking out, he'll cross through that radius. And hopefully, you hear a Zelda chime here. That means that this was successful. That we have you know successfully entered the right code. You will hear as we, you know, in our commentary, we did not say this was on the cartridge. We said, you know, it wasn't really clear if anyone had, you know, gone through this pattern of exits before, or if they did, if they knew what to find next. And that's true that it's not clear if anyone did actually leave the woods in that order, but no, on your cartridge at home, this will not work unless, of course, you do the full ACE setup, and then you start injecting data through the controllers somehow, then this will work because that is actually, you know, the ACE setup is actually how you do this. So what this Lost Woods exit code has unlocked is the beta Kokiri, or this is more like a beta Kokiri because there are several of them. So this beta well, Kokiri- tops and bottoms, heads and bodies. Yes. So the beta Kokiri head is a 3D model left on the cartridge. The beta Kokiri body is, is 3D model left on the cartridge. And there's actually several of each of them. The skeleton and the animation are left on the cartridge. However, the dialogue is made up by our team, written by our, you know, our writers. Um, the the quest idea where the, the, the beta Kokiri is looking for a butterfly specifically. The butterfly is a beta item, but the idea of the Kokiri looking for the butterfly is not beta. That is something that we just made up. Because the idea is we have these individual pieces of beta content. We want to make a story that will have a, pr a certain progression to it that will eventually lead to the Triforce. So, Beta Kokiri, you know, actual beta content to some extent, but not the dialogue. He's looking for bugs. We'll give him some bugs. He does not like these bugs. I am tempted to narrate, but I probably should not do that. I mean, I got Maybe. you if you need it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you could do right. it. <laughs> nah. I won't do it. So, um... We're going to, oh, we got him with his eyes closed. Um, and the, you know, the blinking animations and everything is also part of the, the model that was on the cartridge. So uh, we're going to warp to the uh, uh, Temple of Time, which we're going to Castletown Market to, to buy him a butterfly. Um, so this brings us to our next piece of beta content. So this butterfly, there are two aspects of it that are beta content actually left on the cartridge. Um, there is the 3D model that you will be seeing in a moment. Um, that actually has a bug, that we patched the bug, which is ironic because it's a bug. Um, we patched the bug in the display list uh, on, the, on the butterfly uh, using arbitrary code execution. But other than that, the model is actually there on the cartridge. And there is an entry in one of the item tables for a butterfly, and it is with all of the other bottle items. So it is clear that this was 
you know, it's beta. It's a beta, beta item. However, the idea of it being in this shop, the idea of the shopkeeper's dialogue and the quest for it and everything that is, you know, made up by us to showcase the butterfly. Because, you know, we got to do it. We can just load the 3D model in front of Link and look at it, but that's no fun. You got to, you know, want to actually see it. So butterfly is not in the shop. Talk to the owner. He has custom text here. And so I should mention that, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, there's, there's every custom aspect. It's not just that we had to, let's say, write the text. We also had to write the code that would allow us to change the text on the fly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's actually, so the interesting part about the text, uh, uh, let me just pause that thought here. Here's the butterfly. This is the 3D model. The wings would be a little, a little corrupted if we didn't fix that bug, but we fixed the bug. This is what it looks like. I'm gonna buy it for 35 rupees. And no, we don't want to buy anything else. I'm gonna warp back to the woods. Um, so, so yeah, the text. The interesting part of that is that the text patching, we're actually using code left on the cartridge for the N64DD expansion to Ocarina of Time, which is also known as Ura Zelda. So this is, you know, Ocarina of Time code to support Ura Zelda. That is, it's a, so for, you know, for the expansion, they needed to be able to patch text in the game from the N64DD. And so we're actually hooking into that, not completely using the original, but, you know, largely using the original code there and hooking into that and, and you know, using that to make our custom text. So that is actually more beta content um, you know, some juicy Ura Zelda content for you, even though it's just, you know, some some function, some some code that you never see. Uh, yeah, so here we are almost back at our beta code here. I should also mention the injection is done. It has we've spent I've spent enough time gabbing here about about everything that it has managed to inject all the data for the finale scene. And, you know, for the rest of the time here, I could just unplug the replay device until we get to the, the finale scene. We need to inject further data. Other than that, it's, it's just done. And I'm just playing on controller one. Everything is in the expansion pack. All of the patches have been made to the OS, made to the game engine. And it's just going to pull that data from the memory as it needs it. Um, so you see butterfly. We have a custom icon for the butterfly designed by our artists, also custom text there that says butterfly made by our artists. We can equip it to the C button, show it to the beta Kokiri. Uh, this is actually, so I mentioned the, the butterfly has a, a entry in one of the item tables. It doesn't have an entry in all of the item tables. So this is actually a big Poe that we overwrote as butterfly. <laughs> Did you say you overwrote a Poe? Yes, this is, this is actually a big Poe. Um, because it That's is, you know, cool. the butterfly is in one of the item tables, but we need it in all of the item tables. And instead of like enlarging the tables, you just replace something. That's so, um, oh, sorry. I was just saying that that's that's very clever to do it that way. Yeah, there's a lot of things where like. <laughs> We know exactly what we're going to show, and so it's made to do exactly that. And if you like go out of the you know go out of bounds of that, you you know just won't work or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so this magic powder, this is called Odd Potion. This is a normal adult link trading item. It took me five hours to get that Odd Potion to float at the correct height above Link's hands for this shot here, rather than to be over his hand. Because when Adult Link pulls out an item, he holds it out with one hand and it hovers over the, his hand like this. And it was doing the same thing for Young Link because this is an Adult Link item. That took five hours to fix that. And there are so many little things throughout the presentation which were just like that, where it kind of worked, but then it wasn't right and we had to make it look because you know, if that was wrong, that would have looked like, oh, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't look convincing. That couldn't have been, you know, made by Nintendo back in the day. But since it was all, you know, really up to the quality, then we were able to keep people's suspension of disbelief alive through the through the rest of the the project. And that's that's a huge point. That suspension of disbelief was a major element of of conversation for us throughout the development of this. I don't know how many odd calls we had about hey, how do we handle this element and how do we keep people in that moment without breaking it. And the downside of us doing that is that we did end up in a situation where some people didn't know what was beta content and what wasn't. But anyway. 
Oh, I should also mention while I'm here, the text magic powder is custom because it's actually normally named Odd Potion. So here's our Skull Kid friend. Um, we're just gonna say no here. And just FYI, this is a completely custom Skull Kid. I mean, like the, the 3D model and animations are, are normal, but we totally overwrote the vanilla Skull Kid actor and replaced it with this one that just does this one thing and nothing else. Because, <laughs> you know, that's that's how this works. So we wrote some backstory. Our other other writer um, you know, wrote most of this text. So the idea of this was, you know, in terms of a plot standpoint, you know, we started out with the exits, activate a beta Kokiri. This was something so small and insignificant, getting a bug for Kokiri. And it builds up from thing to thing until, you know, until we get the Triforce at the end. Um, so Skull Kid is going to sprinkle uh, magic powder on our masks to make them more powerful. So there are only two masks that this works on. Again, this will not work on anything other than what we exactly made it for. So we have the Gerudo mask, which will now actually work correctly. And we have the bunny hood, which will also, and I am not, do not have the skill of save state to be able to equip both of these at the same time. That is another glitch speedrunning strategy to be able to equip two copies of the, the same item at the same time that they were able to do during the live run, but I'm actually not good enough at the game. So um, so about these masks are they, and are these beta content. There is no leftover code in Ocarina of Time cartridge for the bunny hood running fast like it does in Majora's Mask. However, Majora's Mask is full of ideas that were in development for Ocarina of Time and then cut. And the fact that these masks are in Ocarina of Time as the trading sequence, and then the bunny hood was in Majora's Mask and actually worked, leads us to believe that, well, of course they wanted the masks to have functions, and they just left the mask side quest in Ocarina of Time in this vestigial state and turned the main contents of that into a completely new game. Then, you know, it's a, then it's a new game. So is this beta content? Well, it's not. So this isn't reactivating something that was found in the cartridge, but this is stuff that the developers were thinking about and left in Ocarina of Time in the state that you know it as, as the Mask side, side quest, and then, you know, became its full version from Majora's Mask. Now, if you're wondering how we actually did the bunny hood running, this is actually uh, not the version from Majora's Mask. He's running faster than Majora's Mask. This is the version from a uh, ROM hack called The Missing Link an Ocarina of Time ROM hack. So we, uh, we you know, m they built on their code for, for this, this version. The, uh, you know, many of the same developers uh, from that ROM hack are the, the same people who worked on Triforce Percent. So uh, here's a Gerudo here, this Gerudo guard guarding this gate. Um, she has normal, you know, normal dialogue, waves us off. Normally, if we wear the Gerudo mask here, she has unique dialogue. She will say, you've got guts, kid, coming around, you know, wearing something like that. But I'm sure many people saw the Gerudo mask, saw the gate and the guard and thought, oh, well, you know, I'd love to, the mask ought to work. She's got to let me in. So, you know, she says, Gerudo child, far from the desert, my, your father must be Hylian. As we know from the Gossip Stones in Ocarina of Time, the Gerudos leave Gerudo Valley out to Hyrule to find their, you know, boyfriends, uh, as the game says. And uh, so, you know, she is assuming that we are a half Hylian, half Gerudo child and will open the gate for us. So this is a completely custom actor. Um, I believe this one is one that we took the actor from... Um, the original actor code, and then made a bunch of modifications to open the gate and everything. These guards are uh, the original guard, but with an assembly patch. Um, so it's the original code gets loaded into memory, and then patches get applied in assembly language to have them respond and, and speak these uh, these flavor text lines to us. 
So they're talking about how you know how hard life is for them over in in the desert here. Serious credit to the writing team for coming up with these lines too, because it was so. It, one of the things that was so interesting about the suspension of disbelief is the lines were so good, you honestly could not tell what was in the original game and what we had added. <laughs> Yeah, and we had Agreed. people. That's how I felt as well. Yeah, we had people reacting to this, saying, "Like, I can't believe that text was localized and left on the game cartridge." So, you know, it wasn't. <laughs> it was made by us. But thank you. Um, you know, our 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 writers are flattered. Um, and you know, we, this was again, this was two and a half years of effort, um, and a lot of that was on the content of making this as. High quality and you know as as good quality as the original game, um, and so I should mention I'm I'm you know changing my masks here out of view of the Grudos, but actually we've given ourselves the uh, Grudos card, um, so they will not arrest us even if I don't have the mask just because they they see that we're you know we're in the club already, um, so the the hiding from them is not actually a game mechanic that's just performance. Yeah, we, we broke that disillusion in this playthrough by just putting on the mask in front of the guard that was at the gate. But <laughs> right, I can just take off the mask here, and they'll just continue uh, speaking yeah. <laughs> the same. Uh, you know, they'll go. This is uh, looping through the four four lines of dialogue. This scene. Um, so Nuburu is not normally here. This is totally custom Nuburu actor, um, and some of the animations are actually also custom. So uh, this scene is actually tricky. We have to have the camera over here when we start or else you will have problems. If we have the camera facing the other way, you will, um, this guard uh, gets special treatment, but the other guards just get deleted. <laughs> and so if the camera is aiming the wrong way, you just see the, the guard disappear. So we have to have the camera somewhere over here, ideally sort of uh, try to get this a little better. Yeah, there we go. And then talk to her and it'll be fine. So as soon as we start talking to her, what happens is, so Nuburu's code is totally custom. These guards are pretty much unmodified. But Nuburu will actually immediately delete the other guards and then start overwriting these, this guard's position information. So Nuburu is basically mind controlling this guard to make her walk back and forth. It basically shuts off the normal code for her and it's actually Nuburu's code that is making the guard walk back and forth here. And that's because we needed the guard to be walking back and forth in view of the camera and not walking all the way to the side. And the reason for that is when the guard exits. If the guard is way over, way over on the side, sorry, it would be this way on your screen, uh, then the guard will run really quickly to get to the exit, and we didn't want that. So I had to play with this a whole bunch to get the guard to walk back and forth. So you can think about it as the guard is eavesdropping on our conversation and just pretending to be busy, walking back and forth here, and actually you know, staying close within the camera so that as soon as whatever moment we interrupt her, wherever she is, she will turn to Nibiru for this line of dialogue, for guards you may leave the girl and I alone, and then she will follow this path, and if the first segment of the path is too long, then it won't look realistic. So that's what we had to do to get that to look right. Nibiru can see through our disguise, blah, blah, blah. Um, we added every, every single line of dialogue of this has the, 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 you know, in the text format, there's a, there's a command for don't let you skip it. And we added that to every single line of dialogue so that Save State couldn't accidentally mash through the dialogue and skip it during the live run. By so the way, I didn't have to watch... actually know about all that guard handling. Somehow uh, that never came up in any of our conversations. Yeah. So I'm just learning about this now. You didn't have to know about that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't need to know. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. And so I should also mention for the world, um, all of the code and assets that we created, our team ourselves, are released on our GitHub. We did not release any Nintendo copyrighted anything, um, you know, textures, whatever, the, some of the models in the, from the ending. Um, but, you know, this Nibiru code, github.com slash Triforce percent, Triforce dash percent written out, slash Triforce dash percent written out. You can just see the code for Nibiru. You can see the code for, it's like 85% of everything we released because, you know, just, just the copyrighted pieces that, you know, we released those we would they would get shut down so we didn't release those but we released everything that we have made so you can look at this code you're welcome to you know there's a very permissive license on it you can use it in your own projects everything like that 
So that you, you know, so this is actually our first custom cutscene, having the, the camera pull back here. There's going to be a larger custom cutscene here in a, mo in a moment. And this whole concept of um, uh, Nuburu teaching Link the, song, the full Song of Time is mostly made up, though there's a couple elements of it that are um, sort of have some basis in, in, in the game. Um, so I'll talk about that in a moment. But this is a you know, fully custom cutscene here. Um, I will go through and show um, a bit later uh, how some of this stuff is made behind the scenes in Blender. Um, you know, I was a tools developer before I started this project, so a big chunk of the effort of this project was actually making or fixing or, you know, updating tools for the OOT community to make this this all of this content possible. Um, so, you know, the, that then has helped other projects in the future. So this is now all custom cutscene. Every you know, every little camera motion is waiting for a text to finish and then doing the next little little shot um, and new burrows. So the, the point of this was we needed to somehow get from getting into Gerudo Fortress to Link having the full Sword of Time. And this is how we sort of wrote in terms of, uh, you know, writing. We wrote our way there. Um, so, you know, we'll say no. I know you want to stop Ganondorf. Of course, we don't want to have, you know, we wanted to have something for that, but we didn't want to have a complete alternate outcome. So. Here we go. So that's a custom animation for Nibiru. The Shania is custom. This is the instrument in the background music of the Spirit Temple. So we just made up and said, oh, well, okay, that means Nibiru plays the instrument, so we're going to give her one. It's a little uh, sort of Middle Eastern oboe kind of instrument, but it really looks like that. And uh, this is another custom animation. And this idea, this full ocarina system um, is semi already there in the game and then semi custom. So the icons for sharp and flat and up and down are custom. Uh, but the, the concept of having an ocarina system that supports all of the notes is not custom. That is actually to some extent already in the game. And I'll describe that more in a moment. And, you know, Save State had to practice a bunch to be able to do that. I've been playing this song for, you know, a year and a half over and over building this project, so I can do it most of the time. We actually had a bug for a while that if you messed up the song input, it was just like my mistake. It wasn't some serious bug, but if you messed up the song input and this teaching um, this this in this shot, um, it would, like go to the wrong text box, and then you would soft lock. And so had to fix that before the final version. Oh, wow. Uh, but yeah, another little uh, another little custom cutscene. This has all been part of the same custom cutscene. Um, and I'll talk about Nibiru in, the, in a moment here. Uh, but one, one last thing. You'll notice she still has the Shania in her hand, and she is uh, you know still following us. The, the game actually has... Um, I should mention uh, while we're here, the game has code that is shared by most NPCs for doing things like having them follow Link, you know, follow him with with their gaze, um, and having him Z-target the correct part of their body and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, so to talk about Nibiru and the full Song of Time and everything, um, there's, uh, I mean, I have to sort of pay attention to this as I'm as I'm talking which is I'm not I'm not the best multitasker in the world here um, so the the blue blocks of time um, the song of time blocks um, when you play the song of time they appear and disappear but they're not actually just appearing or disappearing they're actually going to the opposite timeline so a block that you play if you're child link and you, you play the song it goes to the adult link timeline and then if you go there you'll see it and Excuse me, this is not used in any puzzles um, in the game, except in one place in a lava room in uh, Goron City. It's not actually used in any dungeons or anything like that. It's just sort of like a throwaway side room where they have those. That's the only place in the game that you can actually see that the block is going forward and back in time. Every other place the blocks are used are in a dungeon that you can only access as one age. And with, uh, well, other than using speedrunning strategies to you know cheat your way in into there, which of course you can do that. Um, so these blocks were obviously made to go back forward and back in time, and then they, they weren't used for that purpose. So we can sort of estimate 
um, that they would have been used for puzzles where you actually need to send them back and forth in time, and then you would need to go back and forth in time to, to interact with them, like actual time puzzles, sort of like Skyward Sword kind of stuff. Um, and that isn't in the final game. But the Spirit Temple in the final game is this two-sided dungeon where you do the dungeon as Adult Link and Child Link. And so we said, okay, well, there's, you know, we can speculate that at some point, because of the blocks of time, at some point they must have been thinking about time puzzles where you actually go back and forth in time. And you have the Spirit Temple where you need to have Child and Adult Link. And... You know, there, if, in order to do one of these puzzles, you would have to not go and just put the Master Sword back or pull the Master Sword and go back to the dungeon. You'd actually have to be able to do it right there. And that's, you know, so you, there need to be some way of doing that. And on top of all of that, at the very end of Ocarina of Time, when Zelda sends Link back to his childhood, she doesn't play the Song of Time. She plays Zelda's Lullaby. And not only does she play Zelda's Lullaby, she plays Zelda's Lullaby an octave down. So she's playing a not correct octave version of Zelda's Lullaby to send Link back in time. And that is canonically, we'll send Link back in time because you see it happen in the game. So it's like, okay, obviously, and then the Song of Time, the only thing that the Song of Time does is it opens the door of time and it sends these blocks back and forth in time, but it doesn't know anything for Link. And it, and it satisfies some frogs. It, it, it you know makes them happy. But other than that, that's that's all the song is used for. So... You know, we said, okay, let's assume, let's just put it together and say, okay, the, you, you, there is some, we, we think that maybe at some point in development they were intending the Spirit Temple to have time puzzles where you actually go back in time, use the blocks, Link plays a song, plays the Song of Time to go back and forth in time, but then we, we need it to be a different version of it. We want to show off this other Ocarina system, which exists. So, yeah, a word about the Ocarina system. So, in the game... There are, uh, there are two systems in the code for handling ocarina songs. And every single song is in both systems in the game. It's actually duplicated. The data for the song is in both different formats. One of the formats only detects the five notes, and one of the formats can detect and handle all of the in-between notes. And that second format, with all the in-between notes, is used in the final game for the Scarecrow song, the long Scarecrow song that you can teach to one of the Scarecrows, which is then played after the end credits. Uh, after you beat the game, if you wait for a couple minutes, it'll play your Scarecrow song back to you. And you can use pitch bends, you can use the in-between notes, you can do whatever you want. It can be a very long song. Um, and then the other Scarecrow song, the one that you actually use to spawn the Scarecrow, uses the shorter system, where it just has the five notes. So both of those systems exist. Um, and I should mention that the, the long system with the long scarecrow, it's not just used for the long scarecrow. It's used for every time you learn a song. So, like, I learned that song from Nabooru, even if that was vanilla in the vanilla game, um, you know, any time you learn a song from any character, it's using the long system. Because the NPCs will sometimes put in vibrato and things like that in, in the song playback. And after you finish the main, let's say, the first six notes or whatever, the song will continue for a few notes and play the next piece of it. And that has to use the in-between notes also. So that system exists, it's used in the game, and the shorter system exists, and that's also used in the game, and they both sort of coexist and are used for different things. And so what we did is we made a bunch of patches with arbitrary code execution to use the long system for everything or actually more accurately to change the short system so that the short system also supports all of the notes. That's actually what we did. We didn't really patch the long system. And so we patched most things. One thing we didn't patch was the interface here. You can see the notes are glitchy. The A's, the notes that are A will show up as a C right because that's actually note number two. And then the other ones are way off at the top and they're glitched graphics. So that one was part that we didn't patch, and you know, I, I, it's just it was a lot of effort to make this as is. That we we we, we knew we we're never going to look at the menu there, so we didn't patch it. Um, and uh, you know, the the same thing with the the learning song interface. It only shows eight of the notes. We could have messed with that and made it had a more complicated interface, but we just left it. You know, it is what it is. The next part you're going to really like because this is the Running Man, and you can't go yeah. wrong with messing him up. You're giving me even less to do than usual, so I just get to watch, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it enjoyable? Okay, go on, Sora. Yeah, it's nice. I love having the back and forth. It's wonderful, and typically it's just me and one other guest. But seeing the two of you working together, I'm like, cool, I just, I'm just i just a viewer at this point. So 
Go for it. I'm just back here if you need me. <laughs> the Running Man, you know, normal, the Running Man normal race is totally you know, normally in the game. But the thing is, in there is no code, there is no dialogue, there is nothing for you beating the Running Man. So even if you use speedrunning strategies and glitches, or you just hack it in an emulator or whatever, you give yourself a time of zero, you show up at the Lost Woods, he will already be there, and in his dialogue he will say, huff, huff, you know, you did well, but I beat you by one second. So the Running Man will always beat you by one second, unless you have arbitrary code execution. So we have arbitrary code execution, so we can change fabric of reality, we can change, you know, we, we're actually swapping out the whole running man for an alternate running man that has a better outcome. So that's the, that's a completely vanilla running man that you saw there. This is all vanilla so far with the race. Um, and then after we go through this loading zone, we're going through this loading zone first because otherwise we'll spawn on the other side of the bridge as Young Link, which is a little bit more of a pain in the butt. Whoops, I think I messed that up. All right, so this, me messing this up is a good point to tell you that another part of the Ocarina system that we didn't actually patch is the checking for the, the number of notes that it will check in sequence. This is not actually checking whether I play all nine, uh, 18 notes of this. It's only checking the last eight. So I can just play... Wait. I can just play that part, and it'll still take it. So we didn't show didn't that realize live. that. Sorry, what did you say? I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. So the timer is corrupted. This is sort of legit and sort of not legit. We, it was our own custom code that set the timer to a negative value that, since we went back in time. That's our code. That's not anything in the game. But this is legitimately what the game does when the timer is negative. It is trying to draw the numbers. It has a you know a, a algorithm for drawing tens and then ones and everything, and it gets the ones and the, the value is negative. It reads graphics out of bounds. We actually have there's actually code to make sure that the the timer value stays. So this is it started at negative ninety and it's counting up, and we have code that if it gets above like negative fifteen, it'll go back to negative thirty. So this will just actually cycle forever in case we took too long again. Marathon strats, everything had to be as robust as possible to whatever could possibly happen live. So this we don't actually only have the 90 seconds. We have an infinite amount of time um, to you know go into the future uh, and finish the race. So we're going to the end of the race. Um, playing the song again, I might as well just start from here. The irony so, of being on a show called That's Never Happened Before and telling you we worked ridiculously hard so we would never have to utter the words, well, that's never happened before. <laughs> well, there was a that's never happened before for us live, but that, that, I'll get to that at the very end. Yeah. So here comes <laughs> the running man. So Perfect. this is not the same running man that we started with. This is a completely custom actor. Well, obviously the 3D model and animations are, are you know, vanilla, um, but the, the, the code for him is completely custom. This overwrites, so already in the game, the running man that you start, the, 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 the child running man and the adult running man are different, but we overwrote the one, the version of the running man that comes in here at the end of the race. We replace that with our custom running man that finishes the race. So this is, this is custom actor. All of the dialogue is custom. Of course, beating the running man was a big urban legend, so we used arbitrary code execution to make that urban legend now real. You know, again, at GDQ, this was a real cartridge. A un unmodified ROM, and it was through the magic of arbitrary code execution and manipulating the console's memory that we were able to beat the Running Man, but that's still within the context of the original unmodified game. So, you know, but our, our completely custom Running Man, who we've, who we've now beaten, says he wants to give us a special reward in the middle of the field. The reason we had to do that was that um, we couldn't fight him on the bridge. We needed some more space. So, and we wanted an excuse for it to show another beta item, which is this giant rupee here. I am not good enough to Hess. I've, I've successfully done it a couple of times because it's not super hard, but I'm not going to embarrass myself trying 20 times to do that right now. So I'm just going to walk backwards. And yes, just to review, we went back in time to Child Link, then, tele then we came back into Adult Link. Right. So we started the race as adult, went back in time seven years, went to the end of the race, and then went forward in time seven years. 
So this giant magenta rupee is a bite item left on the cartridge, um, and its real behavior is what you're going to see, except that when it blows up, it only knocks Link over right where he is. I added extra code to knock Link back a great distance and then start the cutscene to start the Running Man battle. So the Running Man boss battle is completely custom code. Some people online were speculating that he has Dark Link code. No. The code for him is, is released. It's on our GitHub. The actor file uh, is not released because unfortunately the, the way that this was made, when the custom animations were made, they're actually inseparable from the model. So we can't, and the model is Nintendo's copyrighted. So even though the animations are released and we did release the animation files by themselves, the model is not released and so you can't, you can't actually play with them. Um, but the code is released, the animations themselves are released. Again, we released every single thing we could that was not copyrighted. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's what we had to do in order to not get it shut down. So, um, yeah, so he's tough. He will dodge a lot of things. Um, we don't really have to worry about dying because we have the inventory editor. We just give ourselves more hearts or Nehru's love or whatever. Um, I can show... Um, Arrows don't work that well, though I can show one way to cheese him. Actually, I might as well cheese him. So I should also mention, as I pause, you can see there's multiple copies of him. That's not a graphical glitch. It's actually, this is actually created by um, the programmer who made the, the Running Man battle. Not me. Uh, Rankai Sija made like 90% of his code here. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to cheese him because this is not the, this is not the real version. So um, why not? First of all, his AI does not uh, handle walls properly. He doesn't walk through the wall, so it's not like he just completely flips through the wall. But he does not know how to... Uh, whoops, that's not that's not what I wanted to have happen here. i got to walk around. He doesn't know how to like plan paths that will intelligently avoid the walls. He just sort of runs into it. Um, so, you know, there he is. Uh, oh, well, then he's going to do that. So I guess, I guess that's a pretty good strategy. Um, but yeah, um, one of the, uh, so I was trying to cheese him against the wall. That didn't seem to work too well. Where is he? He's probably stuck on the wall over here. Again, we, we, you know, coach save state to, um, not, you know, not, not try to put the running man in, in situations that the, the, the flaws in the running man's code would be visible. Um, one thing we can do is, um, if we can get a hit on him, which I'm having trouble doing, and save state was better th at this. When we hit him with the bow, he he gets knocked back directly in 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 a row, in like a straight. Um, I'm just sort of spamming forward here, and hoping I can hit him at some point, but it's not working too well for me. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not as good at him as save state is. So uh, we'll this to, really is that hard on me. Way. This, this is yeah, a it's very, pretty hard. Very hard fight. You know, yeah. at first, at first we made him not too hard, and then it was like, okay, he wasn't. Uh, you know, he was he was taking he was he was dying in only a few hits. Um, it also depends on what kind of hits you're you're doing. Um, so if you hit him with um, uh, what you call it, if you hit him with uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm a bad multitask. If you hit him with stabs crouch stabs like this um, that does double damage if you if you set that up ahead with a jump attack um, uh, there we go finally got him lucky jump attack there um, custom animation custom cutscene custom dialogue um, we were originally had a version of this where he falls over at the end it was really funny but also looked really bad it looked like really bad quality so we you know had to get some custom animations in and everything. And he says, I guess you're a better cheater than I am, which led a lot of people to realize that this was custom content, which we're, you know, we're gl glad that it had that effect. Um, but yes, here, here is his backstory. So completely made up backstory. We needed to, you know, find a way to go from the urban legend of Running Man to getting the ability to equip the medallions. And I'll talk about that in a mo moment. But we also wanted to show why the Running Man could beat us all of these years. So... We wrote a backstory for him that he found this object, this this golden locket that gave him the ability to run extremely fast, um, which of course is what he does. And he says he could even run faster than light, which is the excuse for why he could time travel and get to the end of the race before it started, but we were able to do better. Um, I'm better than still that. suspicious of that physics. 
it's it's not real, but that was our, you know, we had to come up with an explanation. So, and it's funny. So, <laughs> it is know, hilarious. There, there you go. Um, and then, you know, reference to Breath of the Wild here. Um, and of course, the, you know, the redemption arc of person gives up their power and, you know, whatever. So, this locket, the Sage's Charm, this is made up, but the power that the Sage's Charm gives us is actual beta content. So, that's, and, and it's not left on the cartridge, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So, Sage's Charm, 3D model made by us. The dialogue is made by us. The idea of it doubling the magic beater, again, is made up by us. Um, but the idea of equipping the medallions is not made up by us. And the running man runs off into the subset for the final time, end of his arc. It will run for 1,500 units and then despawn. Um, so this is the Sage's Charm. It goes over here. This is actually just a reskinned uh, Stone of Agony, but it has our custom icon there and our custom text here that says Sage's Charm, um, and we can actually equip it. We can actually equip anything here, um, but that's not how we're supposed to use it. Uh, this is more, you know, behind the scenes thing, but actually what it gives us the ability to is equip the medallions. And I better make sure I unequip those other things because if I actually use them, the game will crash. So um, the idea of equipping medallions is actual beta content that was not left on the cartridge, but that was created by Nintendo back in the day. Uh, and that was shown in pre-release videos and screenshots and, um, you know, information like that. And it was also in the some of the beta versions of Ocarina of Time that have been leaked. Uh, we did not copy any code or any data from the GigaLeak or from the Space World Overdump, which is another, the other beta version of Ocarina of Time that leaked. Um, and we had a lot, most of Triforce Percent planned, if not made, before those happened. But we can still use those in our description as saying, that this was, you know, additional evidence. So we see in those versions that you could actually equip the medallions and actually use them. It has the text for them, and it has, uh, you know, other graphics for them. So that is absolutely 100% was made by Nintendo. That was the magic spells. There wasn't a separate Din's Fire, If There Wars, Wind, Nehru's Love. That was just you would equip the medallions and use the medallions, and they would do those magic functions. And there was another one. Um, uh, there were other ones for the other medallions as well. And you could also equip all of the medallions to arrows and then make elemental arrows of all six types. Um, there was like wind arrows and, and, you know, not just light arrows and fire arrows and ice arrows and everything. So, um, yes, that's, that's, you know, actually made by Nintendo. And then the mechanics of equipping the medallions was, you know, written by, uh, the code was written by me. Um, and that involves not just... You know, it involves patches to rendering the medallions here because they're a different size. Um, it, this isn't just draw that picture. We had to change it so that it can draw the picture of the correct size. And also um, this, the animation of having it fly up there, that's also custom. We had to match the original animation that's used for, you know, equipping other things. We had to make that, you know, work for the medallions as well. Um, and also make it make all of those things not happen if you don't already have the Sage's Trend. Uh, yeah, so the, the ice melting in Zora's Domain, using the medallion to melt the ice, this is something that was theorized, this was an urban legend. There isn't really, um, you know, the functionality for this is not left in the game, but the actor that does the ice and the water uh, for Zora's Domain um, decides between ice and water based on Link's age, but it's making that decision every single frame. So all you would have to do all the original developers would have had to do to make this be a dynamic change was change the condition from being, you know, is Link child or adult to being, has Link melted the ice yet? Or something, you know, something like that. So it is dynamically picking between the water and the ice in the, in the final game. So we said that that is sort of arguable that the developers were intending, because they could have made it where it's either at spawn it picks which it's going to be and then and then just doesn't do anything else or they could have made it where they're actually so every scene has different setups for adult and child and for other situations so they could have just made it that there was a, just a different actor in the child version and the adult version that's how most things are in the game and they didn't do it that way they had it pick every frame which one to draw so it's sort of our we're saying that it's sort of arguable but the actual animation and everything for um, melting the ice is is you know made by us um, and you'll notice these uh, steam particles that are orange at first and fade to white. We had to play with that a lot to try to get it to look right. There's also custom code for changing it to go back to having the light reflecting on the walls in Zora's domain, um, which didn't you know normally happen. I should also mention 
we had a bug in the code for fading out the snowflakes because there's snowflakes in Zora's domain. And um, we uh, there was a bug in the code and there was a one in 16 chance that it would crash here. And we, we had only ever crashed once before GDQ and it was in March, it was months beforehand. And so we didn't know what the bug was. And we played it at GDQ with the bug because we didn't know any better and it didn't crash. And then weeks later, when Dwango was preparing for another event to show this, it crashed again. We managed to get a stack trace. I found the bug. I realized that it was a one in 16 chance of crashing every time we showed it. And we just got lucky live. So, um, so yeah, I should have, I, maybe I shouldn't have been talking over that part, but Urban Legend to Melt the Ice in Zora's Domain, that little alcove that we went into, the alcove is there, but it's not actually an exit. We, we patched it to be an exit. So if you actually you know cheat your way down there, you can see the alcove, you walk into the alcove, but it doesn't fade to black. It's not an exit. It doesn't take you to the unicorn fountain. The unicorn fountain here, this is our first what? completely custom scene. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no unicorn fountain. So this is a completely custom scene injected through the controller input. Um, you know, still the vanilla game, the way we're the way we're counting it. But um, you know, this was beta content that was shown in pre-release videos and screenshots. You can see magazine clippings with this unicorn fountain. Actually, if you look closely, Nintendo's unicorns looked a lot more jank than ours did. We really fixed them up and made them look better. Um, the uh, Ocarina of Time does not support overlapping water boxes. So the water in here is actually not real water. Only the water here on the ground is real water, but we figured we wouldn't climb on the statue during the live run. Um, this pedestal of the Ocarina is actual beta item that's actually left on the cartridge. We just had to spawn it in. It's a 3D model. It just has the collision. It doesn't do anything. The Ocarina prompt on top of it is actually a separate actor. Um, so yeah, we just you know spawn those in. Um, and of course it's an Ocarina prompt. It's used to, um, you know, we put told it to ask for Zelda's lullaby. In a moment here, we'll um, see, see, this is another custom cutscene. This is actually the first custom cutscene I made. I did most of the custom cutscenes. Uh, Dwango and uh, Defenna Sam did some of the staff role cutscenes, but I did pretty much everything else uh, for all the cutscene, the custom cutscenes. And I'll show some of that after on our, on our la last, last segment here of how some of that looked behind the scenes. Um, and it's not for now, trivial either. Yes, it's not. Um, so this is the Beta Great Fairy. The Beta Great Fairy 3D model is actually left in the cartridge. Um, it does not have any animations. It's very clearly supposed to be a static model. Um, and in the videos, you can see it just as a static model that you know hovers, floats up and down like this. Um, so the 3D model is actually on the cartridge, but the scenario, the dialogue, all of that is not on the cartridge. Huge credit again and of course, to our writing team. Yes, credit to our writing team, credit to our uh, scene modeling team for you know making this look good. Um, credit to me for programming this part. Um, yeah, so the Beta Great Fairy did appear in the Nintendo screenshots in the Unicorn Fountain. But of course, the Beta Great Fairy was not teaching Link the Overture of Sages. The Overture of Sages was perhaps the most famous video game urban legend. It was a hoax about Ocarina of Time, about how to get the Triforce that involves this song, the Overture of Sages, the same button presses that we have here. Um, you know, the, our, our composing team, which was myself and Rebecca Tripp, um, you know, I, I arranged this song to match the button presses. So the, the actual six note Ocarina song was composed by the hoaxer in 1999, the person who made up this fake leak composed this and then I arranged the background music to actually turn it into a real Ocarina song that you could learn. And of course, you know, put it into the game with arbitrary code execution, making this rumor finally true, just through millions of button presses. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so we learned the Overture of Sages um, and the Beta Great Fairy instructs us to play this song before the Blade of Destiny and the path of the Sages shall be revealed. We learned the Overture of Sages from the Beta Great Fairy in the Unicorn Fountain here. And the Beta Great Fairy instructed us to play the song in front of the Blade of Destiny. So that's where we're going next. So it's important, um, you know, for our lore, it doesn't actually matter for the, for the run, but um, we do not have the Master Sword in our inventory. We have never had the Master Sword in our inventory. We never pulled the Master Sword. We became adult using the full Song of Time, not using the Master Sword. And by the way, here we have to step out into the outer world um, to show uh, that 
the uh, the world is not destroyed by Genin. Um, this is actually we just changed which scene this points to, so it's pointing to the child version of the the scene. Um, if we went out into the market, it would be destroyed by Genin. Um, and but, it is know, horrifying behind to make the that mistake. Yeah, that, uh, we and, had that happen on another show. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and the. Uh, the uh, reason we actually had to go out there was not just to show that, it was because if we don't reload the Temple of Time, it does not work properly. The Temple of Time is actually a very complex area. It looks like it's completely empty. It is full of stuff, especially in some of the scene setups. Um, let me just get this right. I didn't get it right. There we go. Um, it is full of stuff. Sheik is there most of the time, and Sheik is running a lot of the cutscenes. It's Sheik's code that handles various pieces of things. The Master Sword has code that handles things. There's like lighting effects. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff. So um, we had to patch a bunch of that stuff to make this scene possible as adult Link, because there's so much code in the game that just checks is Link child or adult for what to do. And so, for example, if you get into this cutscene and your, your adult link, normally without any patches from arbitrary code execution, you'll see the cutscene, but the door of time won't open because the door of time, the part of the door of time that could open just exited as soon as it loaded because you're your adult link. So the door of time, of course, it's already open. So that code just completely doesn't work because it assumes that we're adult link. So we had to make all of these patches to various pieces of this code and we have to make sure the correct version of all of that loads in and so we have to be in the correct scene setup so we actually have to be walking in so that's why we had to do that um, so these are vanilla cutscenes, but we have a ton of patches in place to allow us to experience these cutscenes as adult link so for example the master sword would not be in the pedestal if we're adult link normally um, and i would show what happens if we pull the Master Sword, because we actually built this, it actually, for the most part, it actually works correctly, and we can have Adult Link pull the Master Sword. But if I do that, we will get stuck in a bunch of cutscenes and we'll waste like five minutes. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what we did during the run, play the Overture Sages in front of the Master Sword, as Ariana Almondos, the hoaxer in 1999, told us. So of course, this is all, I mean, it's not beta content, it's urban legend content that was made up in a hoax in 1999 and finally real in Ocarina of Time through the magic of arbitrary code execution. At SGDQ, again, this was an unmodified ROM, unmodified cartridge. All of these things were done by modifying the console's memory in real time through controller input by TaskBot. Um, so all of that data injected and it's just sitting there in memory and we have all of our patches in the operating system that will load things at the appropriate times you know, all, all doing all of that. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just sort of seamlessly running our new plot now. Um, but this was all created by controller input in within the context of the vanilla game without any modifications in advance. So custom cutscene here. There, every single sage has a custom cutscene. You'll see this. I'll show this scene behind the scenes um, later. But this is a, a you know bunch of little custom cutscenes, completely custom dialogue. This scene. The, obviously, the Chamber of Sages in, is in Ocarina of Time, so we took that scene, we imported it into Blender, and we made a bunch of mod modifications to it. Um, this platform does work if you just spawn into the scene normally, um, and these side platforms do exist, but they're not in quite this pattern of going up um, like this, and there are invisible walls around the side platform. Uh, Raru does have collision, but his arms don't have collision, by the way, um, and these, uh, these bridges that lead to the side platforms are made up by us, they have some interesting um, shaders used on them, actually, or, or graphical effects used on them that are difficult for most emulators to handle. Um, so that's yes. another another part that you can't really emulate without sort of advanced emulator settings. Also, we practiced this a lot to make sure we didn't fall off because it's annoying. I should I should actually fall off and show what happens. So they, you know, goodbye. So what happens is the first bridge will trigger, um, despite his arms are the down. fact that we didn't talk it. to Rauru. Sorry? His arms are down. Yes, his arms are down. He didn't spawn back in correctly. And we don't have an interface. We've lost our whole GUI. But we're never going to need the GUI for the rest of the run. So that's fine. 
it still is in part of a cutscene mode. That's what's going on until we go through a proper loading zone. Um, it will be still think partly that we're in a cutscene. Um, but yeah, so all every single one of these stages is a custom cutscene stored in this in this uh, uh, you know modified scene file. Oh, I, I just skipped through the rock joke, but Darunia makes a rock joke because he's a Goron and they're they're rock people. So uh, yes, our, our you know we we so this is you know this is based on a link between worlds where you go to the sacred realm the same the same scene basically. Um, you know, Ruto is thirsty for Link, but who isn't? Um, and, you know, you go up the, 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 the circular stairs to all the side platforms and receive blessings from the stages. So that's, uh, you know, that's that's what we're, we implemented here. Um, and again, the side platforms are in the vanilla scene, but they aren't in this nice staircase pattern. And of course, there's no staircases that go between them. Um, and these, these, the sages are all custom. It's actually one actor that handles all of the sages and will pull in the right, you know, pull in the right object and, and draw it and have them do their animation and everything. And because it's basically the same code running for all of them, except for Sheik. Sheik has a bit of a different thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, so, you know, she said, uh, Nibiru said, um, uh, she would see us again in a few years when we talked to her earlier. And now here she is. They, they don't, you know, don't interact again any, after this, but they do have collision. Just in case we, we had to walk into Rauru, so we need to have them all have collision. Their collision is appropriate to their body size. The, so the size of the cylinder is based on their the size of their body. So that's you know, that's a little tidbit you might not have noticed. Um, so this is, you know, in our own canon, you know, made up canon for this. Uh, this is our first time meeting each of these sages, except for Nibiru. Um, and Sari, of course, already knew us. So this is, you know, Impa is, is first introduced and says, oh, you must have been the boy from Princess Zelda's dreams. And she says, we got her Sage's Charm. So the Sage's Charm was supposed to be Impa's in our, you know, our, our custom plot that we made here. Before you go on um, too far, there's yes. questions about the music. Oh, yeah. So this uh, music track, I'm sorry, I'm not I'm usually hearing this. I have muted in my own audio here. Uh, but yes, this music track was arranged by Rebecca Tripp. This is the only song that was not arranged by me. Um, uh, actually, well, the, the, with, with a caveat you'll hear about in a minute. Uh, but yes, this is a, you know, a custom arrangement based on the original Sage's theme. And then, you know, she, she elaborated it into a more appropriate for, you know, climbing the stairs up to the Triforce. Any other things I should address before I walk up onto this pl platform here? I think everything else I'm going to save for later. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say a couple things for the end, probably. We could ask. So there's six sages. We already talked to the six sages. Here's our seventh platform and our seventh sage. This particular line, we worked on, I workshopped this with the other writer a bunch. We, we want, we were, you know, sort of wanted to say the one with the ability to execute arbitrary code, but we thought that would be too spot on. So we just went with bend and shift time itself, but some people realized from this dialogue that this was, you know, that this was uh, custom content. Um, you know, talking about the timelines. We've known each other in ages past and surely in other timelines of the present. Um, you know, our destiny is about to change forever when we get the Triforce. Um, you know, this is trying to, trying to make this sound like what Sheik would actually tell Link, but also Sheik sort of knows that something a little bit more then then reality is happening here. So, you know, here's our here's our questions. What our burning question that Link could ask Sheik, since we showed the second one during GDQ, we'll show the first one today. Link is asking Sheik, are you Zelda? <laughs> I'm hoping food so responds. <laughs> And of course, this is a oh. reference to the Retro Studios <laughs> Sheik game that was canceled. Um, oh. You know, would be nice if Sheik could get their own game someday, but, you know, we'll have to wait a bit longer, I guess. Um, I hope oh, it does happen so someday. That was so, precious. So, you know, let's not keep the GDQ audience waiting from what they've been here to, uh, you know, to see. And, you know, I, ironically, I was actually surprised by the people reacting to this online. 
a couple of them definitely understood at this point that we were about to get the Triforce, but there was enough people who didn't understand. I thought we were being really heavy handed with the symbolism and everything and everybody would understand what was past this door, but you know, maybe people weren't as up to date on the lore and everything. And of course, at this moment, I, I you know, emphasized to everybody that this was an unmodified cartridge and we hadn't changed anything about the game in advance. All we did was press buttons very fast. And that's true. Millions of button inputs, encoding, large scale changes to, you know, custom scene, custom dialogue, custom actors, custom everything, but still within the context of the original game. No ROM changes, no, no, nothing modified in advance, just arbitrary code execution. And as I go through this loading transition, you will see a Triforce warp wipe. That is actual beta content left on the cartridge. You just have to set a particular type of scene transition and it will show the Triforce as the wipe. So here you go. And this scene, the Triforce scene is a not left on the cartridge, but it was created by Nintendo back in the day, shown in a very famous early uh, video, you know, an advertisement for Ocarina of Time. We recreated it. Um, you know, we added the animation of Link reaching and touching the Triforce, and of course, the text is custom. I was amazed that even with it being so on point in this message, that some people still believed that it was in the original cartridge. I think at this point, even the people were like, no, there's no way that was actually on the original cartridge, right? I think they, even those people realized that this couldn't have been because it says 23 years, it's self-referential. It's 23 years is the time between Ocarina of Time releasing and SGDQ, 23 and a half years. Um, and, you know, of millions of players around the world. So the dream to get the Triforce in Ocarina of Time was not previously possible until we have arbitrary code execution and we can create the entire scene the Triforce, the Triforce chest, everything. You know, this scene, we, we, we made it as close as we could to the scene that Nintendo created back in the day, as, you know, accurate as possible. Um, but it is, you know, created by us. It was not left on the cartridge. But arbitrary code execution is left on the cartridge, and we can use that and get this without modifying the game in advance. So that's what we've done. So I'm going to move on. So, you know, what happens next? Link gets the Triforce. What would Link do with the Triforce? Well, first of all, he has to have a little chat with the goddesses, and the goddesses have to tell him. He doesn't realize at first that he's hearing a voice in his head from the goddesses. We considered having a more elaborate scene for this, but the more elaborate scene is coming next, so we're, we're stuck with this for now. Um, custom cutscenes, I will show this cutscene in behind the scenes. Uh, specifically, this is one of the most interesting ones. Um, <laughs> this is actually one of the last ones that I made. Um, I was sort of working on this at the same time as the next scene, but um, I, I was, I was, I was proud of this cinematography here. As you should be. And the music is also arranged by me. This is the uh, Triforce Chamber music from A Link to the Past, arranged for Ocarina of Time Engine. So, you know, I started this whole thing as being a music arranger. I got the opportunity to have my own music arrangements in an unmodified copy of Ocarina of Time in front of hundreds of thousands of audi audience members. So that that was really, you know, part of the special, I and mean, there's a lot of special parts of this for me, but that was, that was part of the special part for me. Um, so we get to this choice. This is the only choice in the game that we didn't implement anything for the other options. We just went with see the future, but just for the sake of showing off, it, the game does not check which dialogue option I pick. It just closes the dialogue box and then goes on to the the ending, which is only one ending. So I will pick a different option, and you will see that nothing nothing happens. Um, but you know, sorry, it's see the future. That's what we that's what we designed for. So Link requests to see the future. Link is warping in time to the future. We zoom in on the Triforce chest, and then we zoom back out from the Triforce chest, the same place, but tens of thousands of years in the future, the same location in the sacred realm is now in the sky. It's, you know, way back when it wasn't really clear if the sacred realm was different from the sky. Well, it's sort of, that's a lot of lore. I won't get into that now. But anyway, this is the sacred realm in the future. And Link is warping back in.
and tens, tens of thousands of years in the future, this is what Link looks like. So this is, this is not a video. This is the N64. This is injected code, injected models, injected patches to the RSP microcode that allow us to do cell shading. This is, you know, that was thought to not be possible on the N64 to do cell shading. It was thought not to be possible to do high poly models. Uh, you know, the, 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 the animations on their uh, clothing and hair are being computed live. They're not, they're not like pre-baked animations. It's, it was actually smaller size to not inject all of the hair animations and everything and have them actually simulated. So physics simulation, voice acting. All right, chat. Fu, is this a slow mode or sub only chat, or can anyone participate? Um, I know for the main events, it's. I believe it's an anybody can participate chat. All right, folks. Well, I think you guys know what to do now. Everyone, it's time. Type here together in the chat or explore e. the emotes that are available to you. Yeah, we actually support most of the GD, well, a lot of the GDQ emotes, not all of them. The, the ones that are like sort of positive in, in tone and some Twitch emotes. Uh, so we'll leave it right. here. I think they're going. Yeah. Okay. Should I should press A? Yeah. Definitely. All right. Look. Oh. So, yes, these are live. These are actually being captured right now. This was not pre computed. You will, you know, hopefully we'll see your name. Some of them are showing up off screen, so you might not see your name. But this is actually real. The replay device is in, is, uh, well, I, we have scripts on the computer. They're reading Twitch API, grabbing chat messages, encoding them, sending them to the replay device. The replay device encodes them into controller input, sends it to the console. The console decodes it back into messages and renders them on screen. Oh, I should shut up there for a moment. <laughs> renders them on screen like the way a web, sort of like how a web browser does. It's actually dr drawing the text properly. Um, I should mention the voice actors are not the not the Nintendo voice actors. There are other professional voice actors that we you know got onto the project, but not the actual voice actors from Nintendo. But they did a very good job, um, and you know thank you for being here together with us. Um, and we we actually have another little a little surprise after this scene uh, for the next uh, next next segment here. But I'll let this play out here. Listen carefully. So, Link finally speaks in the Zelda <laughs> game. Breath of the Wild, Link speaks in Ocarina of Time. And, uh, you know, this is, we were actually expecting that to happen, some usernames there. But, here we are. You'll hear some new music. This is the <laughs> Taskbot theme. Oh, which we have added just for today, and I will talk a little bit more about the music after it's done. But I want to let it play out for everybody. Please enjoy. This was originally composed by Whimsy Heath and John Gabriel UK, and adapted by Soren. So actually, while it's play, I playing, I will mention a couple of things. First of all, the staff role is also totally custom cutscenes made by us and injected into the game with arbitrary code execution, just like everything else. Um, you know, this wasn't just a video we switched to. This is all in engine. Um, the music that you're hearing, this is the theme of Taskbot. This is playing in the Ocarina of Time engine. You may not have realized, but Ocarina of Time and all of the first-party Nintendo 64 games, part of their sound engine is actually a chiptune engine. <laughs> they have a oh. system for playing these waveform, chiptune waveforms, and that is used for some sound effects, like the Zelda chime, but not used in any music. 
So I specifically arranged this for that system, which is basically complete, not completely unused, but most people are not using that for, for music. Pyramid in the background there, by the way. And shout outs to GDQ Hotfix for having us on today. Oh. <laughs> Just for you. That's so cool. So, so it's a little emotional. less impactful of an ending without the bombastic orchestral music, but you know, we wanted to give an opportunity to show off another not fully unused, sort of partially used, but mostly unknown aspect of Ocarina of Time is this whole chiptune synthesis engine. Um, so, you know, we wanted to present something and the, the audio, you know, the music track was not a perfect arrangement for this. I will admit that I, you know, there were some issues. Actually, I ran into a bug with the noise channel. Um, it seems like Nintendo didn't really test it and it had some problems and it sometimes crashes the RSP. So I uh, had to cut the noise based instruments, the hi-hats and stuff. So, you know, this is not my, not my finest work, but I did want to show that off today. So we are at the end, you know, the Triforce in the Sacred Realm in Ocarina of Time, the ending that many of us wish that we could have had. Um, and, you know, now we have created for ourselves through the magic of arbitrary code execution and a lot of engineering and a lot of, you know, asset creation and, and partners, work with our partners. Um, and, you know, 20, more, more than 25 people contributed to this Triforce percent over the last two and a half years. Um, and it has been a, a privilege to be, you know, participate in this and, and direct this project. Wow. Wow. That was incredible. That was incredible. Everyone in the room is standing, standing for Mr. Tazba, Dwayne Gorosi, Soren, and Save State. So incredible. I want to read one last donation. I think this really hits it well. The Sound Defense donates $25. They say, this Ocarina of Time beta showcase may be the most fascinating thing I've ever seen at a GDQ. I can picture a game containing all of this interesting story content, and I want to see more. Thank you to Save State and the Tazbot team for showing this off. Give it up one more time. All right, everyone, we are having a great night. We're raising money for Doctors Without Borders. We will be right back after this. Don't you go anywhere.